A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Our cases this week, a TV doctor who gave advice to millions of people over three decades avoids jail time after pleading no contest to soliciting nude photos from a nine-year-old girl. Prosecutors say the doctor messaged the little girl with promises of being a star in a movie and then asked the child for, quote, sexy pictures. As part of the plea deal, the celebrity doctor, who, by the way, I worked with for 13 years, will be on probation for two years and has to register as a sex offender. Is that justice? But first, it is a case that we have been following for a long time, and we promised you we would see this through to the end. This is the case of the eight-year-old boy with autism who was so severely abused that he froze to death in an unheated garage that his father and stepmother forced him to sleep in. His father, a New York City cop, has already been convicted of murder, and now the stepmother who refused to let that little boy in the house to use the bathroom has had her day in court. And she's been found guilty of second degree murder. We are recording this on Wednesday, March 15th of 2023. And our guest today is Mike Cavaluzzi, a Los Angeles based criminal defense attorney, a friend of the show who hasn't been on probably in almost a year. You've been so busy, Mike. Oh, and the phone rings. (laughs) You're so busy. They're still. It's fine. It's fine. (laughs) We're we're so excited to have you on the program, Mike. Honestly, you had court today, so we moved the podcast down, and then you got stuck, and we moved it again. We've really been waiting to have you on. You're one of our favorites. Thank you so much. It's really great to be here, and I'm glad we could make it work today because you're right. My schedule today was pretty challenging. Yeah, and we are appreciative of that. We're going to get to the serious stuff in a second, but I just want to let everyone know at the end of the show, we are going to question Mike, um, Mr. Fancy Pants over here. You attended the Oscars this this weekend. Oh my, I when did. I saw it on I Instagram, the I was like, saw all the stars. <laughs> oh my God. I, I'm going to question you about that later. You Absolutely. Are- it was incredible. Oh my God. The only guest ever on <laughs> True Crime Daily, the podcast, to have attended the Oscars. Oh, and Anna, this was my fourth time attending the Oscars. <laughs> not, to, not to brag or make oh. you more jealous, but oh yeah, my God, this you, was my fourth time. You really are Mr. Fancy. I've got friends in high places. <laughs> oh my gosh. What, what kind of criminal actors do you represent? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Thank you. And please, I'm going to just a warning for everyone here. I came back sick from New York. I am sick. I'm home and quarantined. And excuse me if um, I cough or sneeze. And I've got, if you see these little vapors, this is my personal humidifier. So please bear with me. Um, this is a very important program. These are two cases I really want to talk about. And so um, I insisted that we do the podcast this week. So let's, let's get to this right now. Our first case is out of Long Island. And this is a a second trial that is part of a heinous murder case involving an eight-year-old boy with autism. And this second trial is now concluded. His stepmother has been convicted of second degree murder. And the boy's father, a former NYPD officer, has already been convicted. His trial was last year, Mike. So we've covered this case for three years now. Since January of 2020, when that little boy was found dead, we have been covering this case. That little boy is Thomas Valva. He was found frozen to death. Hypothermia. I mean, this unbelievable. It's 19 degrees outside. And he and his older brother, who also has autism, both of them were forced to live in these deplorable conditions because they wouldn't be let inside the house. Deplorable is no heat, no access to a toilet, no blanket, no pillows, no mattresses, no food, because that's how they would be punished. All this has already been validated and corroborated in court. You know, I'm not even dealing with allegedly here. This is for sure what happened to these kids. Um, Honestly, it's one of the worst cases ever, Mike. And I get very upset about this case, which is why I want to see this to the end. And I know you're incredibly empathetic. Um, 
But when you have a case this heinous, and there was plenty of video and audio corroborating parts of the abuse from um, cameras inside the family home and surveillance cameras around the house when we get to the details of this. What do you do with a case like this, Mike? This is a difficult case to have empathy, um, especially for the father, because he feels to me like he was the mastermind behind all of this. And he has a history of abuse against the kid's mother. Um, And so he, to me, is the central villain in the case. And one of the things that interested me here was that when Angela Polina testified, I would have expected that she would have testified that she lived in fear of Mark Valva. And that's why she did what she did, that she was following his orders, following his commands. Instead, she seems to minimize the conduct, seems yeah. to suggest that they didn't appreciate the danger. And so rather than focusing on some level of duress or um, lack of uh, independence in terms of the conduct, uh, which I think could have been an effective defense if she were sympathetic to the jury. And they have a history of this abuse with Justina, his ex-wife and the boy's mother. Um, I would have expected if she testified that that's what she would testify to. Instead, they focused on the um, because there is not necessarily an intent to kill here. The prosecutor needs to show a reckless disregard for human life. Yeah. And and, and that's what she focused on. We didn't realize it was that cold. We I think. Oh, please. It's 19 degrees out. Please. I get it. But and to me, that's what was curious to me is that to have her take the stand in pursuit of that defense, which to me feels unwinnable versus a defense of I was an abused uh, fiance who felt that I had no choice but but to abide by this heinous man's orders because otherwise he would have done to me what he forced me to participate in doing to those two young boys. And there's a part of me that thinks that perhaps her defense attorney and I could empathize with this feeling, is her defense attorney got to a a point of exasperation with her and and her inability to connect with what she had done, um, that he might have just said, testify and say, tell your story, tell your truth, because I'm not going to interfere. Because this would be interesting for people to know, the strategy of a defense purely lies with the attorney. The attorney makes strategic decisions, not the client. However, whether or not to testify is the sole decision of the client. The attorney can give guidance, the attorney can make suggestions, but the client has to decide whether or not to testify. So it's possible her lawyer said, not a great idea to testify. You're gonna say things that will be harmful because she did herself no favors. No. And she did say things that were harmful, but he might have she might have insisted on testifying and he might have just said, you want to testify, go to it. Right. You, you can't prevent them. And I yeah. always say this when it comes to taking the stand in your own defense. If you can answer the questions that the jury has, if you can fill in the yeah. pieces of the puzzle that will make sense to them and therefore your defense will make sense. If you can explain the situation in a way, I, it doesn't happen often, but it has happened where juries have acquitted because, as I always say, when you hear the truth, it makes sense. Now, is that justifiable? Does that mean it's a lesser charge? That I don't know. But if you can't answer those questions in, in a logical, reasonable human way, um, that is has that still remains that you maintain your humanity, then you should not take the stand. Yeah, yeah. And look, we have this really clear contrast here, right? Because of the Murdoch trial where yeah. he testified and granted he did himself no favors, but he attempted to be empathetic. I mean, he definitely stayed. But it was an act and the jury didn't buy it. But he sort of the idea is that testimony could sometimes be an act of desperation. And I think in Murdoch's case, it was an act of desperation. And he did what he could. The facts were what they were. But in her case, it was also an act of desperation. But she didn't even seem to be on the on any sort of a page that was going to garner her sympathy. That's why I say that it so surprises me that if she took the stand, that the testimony was not that she was being controlled 
by this monstrous fiance. Mm, and she, they're that both, wasn't her because they were, they're both, both monsters. monsters. That's exactly monsters. right. Monsters. So 45 year old Angela Polina, who is Thomas's stepmother, she was engaged to Thomas's father. Michael Valva, the former NYPD cop, and the couple shared this home. This is the background. Shared a home, and it was a blended family. You had Michael's three boys, uh, two of them with special needs, and then you had her three girls. Now, mind you, everybody lived in the nice warm house except for the two boys with special needs because that's what you do. You treat them worse than I don't know what. They were treated so badly. So it did not take long for this jury to find Paulina was part of this prolonged torture of Thomas that led to his death. Um, I mean, she did try and blame it on the boy's father. I will say this, Mike, while she didn't have a great defense, she kept saying, well, really, it was Michael. Really, it was Michael. But yeah, yeah, she definitely tried to blame him. But then when she was questioned about, oh, so on that night that it was 19 degrees out and the boys are in the garage, where were you? Oh, I was in my, my house in my bedroom. Were you comfortable? Yes. And that, that's it. The yeah. jury didn't, I mean, the jury heard a lot more and saw a lot more, but that just was, you know, she, jurors were very upset. But again, it, it really surprises me because you're right. She tries to minimize her role and sort of push things off to him, but she doesn't attack him at all. And it makes me think that she's still in love with him. That's somehow or maybe, maybe she, they're communicating. Or, or maybe she is more guilty or equally guilty as came out in this, in some of the testimony. But usually the more heinous the person, the more quick they are to lie and to push mm. it on to the other person. There's just something about that relationship that feels very curious to me that she still feels aligned with him even though yes she says it was mostly him he was she doesn't fully attack him and that was the only way for her to win not that what that it would have worked but to me it was the only possible path to winning would have been for her to completely villainize him and so I, Mike, and I feel like she didn't what do you make of this because this came out in court there there was um a text thread that was between angela and michael where she wrote to michael quote you want a life with me? Give them back. Yeah. Meaning the boys. Meaning the boys. Okay? So that already is disgusting. That's disgusting. Then in court, they brought up a 2019 text message from Michael to Angela. Okay? And this was read at trial. Oh, my gosh. This is where Michael told her, quote, My son is not going to be treated like an outcast anymore. He's no longer going to sleep on a concrete floor anymore. He's not going to be exiled. I'm not having it anymore. Oh, okay. So now you have him, that that text, you know, shows me she was behind this. Believe me, he's very guilty. So don't, I'm not defending I him. I know, I know. Right? And then, but there's one more text message that I have to read. So remember how we're talking about the boys are in the garage without anything? Oh my God, they read this chilling. This is how the jury was losing their mind. So Angela then texts Michael about the conditions in the garage being too cushy for the children. Okay, saying, quote, everything is coming out of there, books, clothes, etc. They are too comfortable of a punishment because you made it a home. There should not be one thing that belongs in a bedroom there. And that text message was reportedly sent on January 5th, days before Thomas froze to death. They're horrible human beings. Horrible, yeah. horrible human beings. So, I mean, I don't it's know. It's indefensible. How, it's indefensible. Yeah. And, and, the, and that's why the jury's like, get out of here. You're yeah. guilty. You're guilty. So let's, I, um, you know, we've done several podcasts on this. So if you really want to hear the entirety of this case, we really have broken it down for you step by step. We're going to go through some of it now for those of you who haven't heard the case before or those of you, you know, just, just so you can understand why this is such a significant case. So... Um, we talked about this blended family, but the biological mother of the three boys, and of course, of, 
Thomas, who was murdered. Here are the dynamics. The boy's biological mother, Justina Zabuco Valva, marries Michael in 2004. The couple has three sons. That's Anthony, who's 10, Thomas, who's 8, Andrew, who's 6. Michael joined the NYPD a year later in 2005. And that's where he worked until he was suspended after his arrest. And I do believe, and we've talked about this before on the podcast, that when the biological mother begged the courts and begged social services to take her concerns seriously about the abuse of the children, the courts seem to always side with that very believable man carrying a badge who's a New York City cop, rather than listening to the wife who was a corrections officer but was an immigrant. I'm just saying, who has entree to the court there, Michael? Yeah, obviously, the police officer. (laughs) And so it always sided his way. And what a surprise. So he gets custody of the three kids, which is shocking to me because it doesn't seem like he even wants the kids. But he he ultimately does get custody. So they separate in 2019. And Nassau County County police say that they made like 20 visits to the house, to, to to the house, then to the houses because of the sparring exes making accusations and apparently the claims were unfounded, which I kind of think that's not really true given the situation under which this little boy died. Michael gets full custody and then Justina is fighting for visitation. So then Michael moves in with Angela and her three kids and they start this new blended family. But things are not good because the children, oh, oh my God, in Michael's in Michael's murder case, all these teachers took the stand. It was horrific. These are teachers who wrote reports that sent it up the chain to the school district, to social services, to the police, to anyone who would listen. These teachers documented the abuse that they were seeing. The kids would arrive at school in dirty clothes that were soiled because they would soil themselves, not only because they didn't have access to a bathroom, but because of the amount of stress that they were under, they could not function. They dug through garbage cans looking for food. The teachers would save food for them. And so they had bruises, they had marks. You know, they were told that they would only get food if they behaved. And then if they misbehaved, the food was withheld. It was all part of this torture. It, it was the, the whole system. The judge even said this at sentencing. The entire system failed yeah. this child. Yeah. Everyone is responsible and has blood on their hands. I believe that. I Family do too. courts failed. You know, the this family was under supervision for a year, but half the time, I guess, if they didn't answer the door, then I guess everything was okay. I mean, we've covered all of this in in, seri- in several podcasts, but I just, it it just undoes me, you know. And I don't care how many convictions we get, Mike, until there is a true investigation, even though the county says they're they're doing one, till people are held in the system accountable for yeah. this child's death, there will be no change. Yeah, I agree. There will be no change. So let's get to the day that Thomas died. What a her- His last few hours on earth were the worst ever. The saddest thing I could think of. On the morning of January 17th of 2020, just after 8 a.m., Thomas had urinated and defecated on himself because he was left in a garage with no access to a bathroom. Besides, he's freezing to death. And there is a chilling audio recording from a security camera this captured inside the house where Michael, the father, is telling Angela, the fiance, that the boy should be ordered to eat the feces as punishment. And then he yelled really horrible things. (sighs) This case undoes me. Then what does he do? He drags this boy outside in the freezing cold, strips his clothes, and turns on a garden hose in the 19 degrees and freezes the hoses him down like like he's outdoor furniture. And so the boy collapses and hits his head. And this is captured by surveillance cameras at other homes. And so now 
you know, there's, of course, because don't comfort the child, scream at him to wake up because that's what you do when you have a child who's injured. And so they try and put him in the tub and about an hour later, he can't be resuscitated. Michael Valva calls 911 and he makes sure to tell the 911 operator, he's a cop. And this is what he tells them, that, that the little boy fell um, in the driveway running to catch the school bus. Boy's taken to the hospital. He has hypothermia. His body is just so cold. He's pronounced dead. And it doesn't take long for cops to figure out what really happened. Because remember, the surveillance cameras will tell the story that there was no bus, that he didn't run. (coughs) Excuse me. And that's not what happened to him. Oh, my God. And so prosecutors said that Thomas, when he was passed out and was catatonic at this point, before 911 um before um, first responders got there. Uh, That's when his fiance asked Michael what he was doing. And supposedly Michael said, suffocating him. That's what I'm doing. Again, (laughs) picked up by the security cameras. Unbelievable. So, you know, then a week later, the two of them get arrested on January 24th of 2020. And so begins this odyssey that we have been on in trying to report this. I'm just so upset by this. I say this all the time on the program. What is justice and what would it look like? Is this justice, Mike? Is Have we seen justice here? I mean, it's the most justice that we can get. I, I mean, there, there could be a death penalty, I guess, but I'm pretty opposed to a death penalty. They most likely will both spend the rest of their lives in prison. But they got second degree um, murder. Why didn't they get first degree? Even... Because for first degree murder, there must be a premeditated, actual intent to kill. That is difficult to prove here. There may have been an intent to harm, an intent to punish, and this reckless disregard for human life. But that is what makes it a second degree murder. It doesn't matter how horrific the treatment is. If, it does, if there is not an actual intent to kill... Um, there cannot be a first degree murder. And as horrific as the behavior is, often people abuse and torture, but not to kill, simply to abuse and torture and control. And so I don't know that the evidence here supports, in fact, I feel pretty certain it doesn't support a first degree murder. A second degree murder still carries a potential life sentence. And in a case like this, it will most likely result in a life sentence. I mean, the law is always changing. There could Mm -hmm. be elder parole that they become eligible for, but they will be spending decades in in prison. But cases like these, I don't know that you can ever get real justice. I think the only way to look at these cases, at least for me, to to have them be some way instructive is to look at the psychology behind them, because it is... The behavior is so horrific as to make you want to investigate it. You know, like, why? Why is this? It's not like, you know, if a jealous uh, boyfriend goes out and kills his his girl, his ex-girlfriend and her new boyfriend, you know, you sort of understand how that happens. You understand like sort of rage killings or revenge killings or gang killings. There is a psychology that you can understand there. This one's really, really hard to understand why a father would torture his disabled young sons when there seems to be an option of sending them back to their mother. Like, like yes. I'm not understanding where this comes from. Unless you're this... trying to spite the mother because she wants yes. the children and you're a control freak and you're a horrible human being, you're yeah. a monster. Um, and and it's that is the part that undoes me because so many people did try to tell the truth and even if you didn't believe the biological mother who should have been believed but let's just say take her out of the equation because of all the accusations back and forth how how could no one believe the school teachers this is the part that undoes me Again, you know, I haven't had a lot of experience in the dependency courts or the family courts, but what little I have had, and I have been in those courts, I've argued in those courts, I don't consider myself an expert by any means, but I have found them sometimes to number one, be very slow moving, Mm -hmm. um, to not attach real urgency when they should, 
They simply continue matters, let them go. Let's have it investigated, send somebody out there, let a social worker do a report, as opposed to saying, I need these people in my court right now and we need to address it immediately. They don't attach a lot of urgency to these situations. And they can often even be dismissive of, mm-hmm. of, of reports, even when they're coming from reliable sources like teachers. It's like they just want to push them away. And uh, I think they make maybe an assumption because it's probably true nine out of 10 times that nobody actually dies or gets gravely injured. So they oh, just think there's time. They but were so, happens, they were malnourished. They were skinny. Yeah. They were small. I mean, no, it, 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 it was horrible. Obviously, again, you know that I feel as strongly as you do. It's just trying to understand or explain how this got here, because I get how challenging it is to process how this happened when there were trustworthy sources uh, yeah. you know, uh, ringing the alarms when there was another parent, uh, when there were other children, other people, and even yeah, and even, under investigation you know, or supervision for a yeah. year by the county, and, it's and, just and the, the the level of of hatred and and vitriol um, and inhumanity that that Michael and Angela are expressing when they're speaking to each other in those texts, and even Angela in her testimony, it's so repugnant. Again, as to cause you to question why and how, where, how does this happen? How does a person like Michael become that person? You know, oh. you just it, it feels uh, it makes you want to look into his own background and, 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 and where he learned this behavior, because that's uh. what it has to be. Well, in Michael's uh, trial, he, his defense was he admitted, yes. Guilty on the child endangerment. Yes, Yes. I was abusive, right? That was his strategy in the trial. But the defense said that the father never meant to kill the boy and that that really was where the jury struggled in both cases, even though they found them both guilty, was that whole disregard, that reckless disregard for human. And and that was the challenge, which, you know, after the jury understood what that meant, it's like, yes, these two meet this threshold. If you think about it, it's almost worse that Michael did not intend to kill his sons, but in fact, then intended to torture them (laughs) for the rest of their lives. Yeah, it's almost worse. I I agree with you. So back. I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say one reason why he probably wanted to maintain custody um, was because they were probably getting um, uh, payments from they get Social Security. If they're disabled, if they're autistic, mm-hmm. then they're getting some kind of uh, disability. Payments. And then he doesn't Probably have to play, and he doesn't have to pay child support yes, to the biological right. mother. That's, so, that's, how, yeah. that's how awful it is, how cynical yeah, it, it is. it is horrible. Yeah. It is as horrible as that. So Michael's trial was six weeks long. As we said, teachers testified. It was very painful. It was horrific. Um, and it took seven hours of deliberation. Michael Valva was convicted on November 4th of 2022 of second degree murder and four counts of child endangerment. And he received a maximum sentence of 25 years to life on December 8th of 2022. What the judge said in imposing his sentence, he was visibly emotional. He was disgusted as the rest of us were. And he said, quote, how did all of us as a community allow this to happen? We can never let this happen again. And that's it. The entire system, the entire justice system and the investigative system and child protective services and family courts completely failed this child without question. So then Angela Polina's murder trial started last month, February 27th of 2023. Selecting a jury, Mike, was near impossible near impossible they went through hundreds hundreds of potential jurors and they were dismissed because they admitted that they could not be fair and impartial plus this is a huge case out there last week when i was in new york doing the podcast there i i was on um good day new york talking about the podcast and they asked me what's the you know like the most heinous case you've covered and i said it was this one and not because of you know i was in new york because it really is Everyone knows about this case. So I don't know how they ever got a jury, finally found people who could try and be impartial and had not been tainted by this horrendous story for the three years that this has been unfolding. So they finally get a jury. 
And Polina's defense argued that she had not committed the crime, meaning, meaning that Thomas's death was caused by the actions of her fiance, Michael Valva, and very specifically the hosing down of the child. So that's what they were pegging everything on. But, you know, the jury, when they finally got into the deliberation room, one of the questions they had was they wanted to know more about the hypothermia and yeah. uh, and Thomas's condition because they needed to determine whether his being in the garage when it was 19 degrees out overnight and it had been cold for a long time, whether that is really what caused the hypothermia and then the final blow was the freezing cold water in the yeah. backyard. And that is when the jury said, no, she doesn't get to put this on Michael. This is on her. She wanted them in the garage. She was complicit in that. She may have not been holding the hose, but she made that little boy so fragile and vulnerable by the time he was hosed down that his body just gave in. I I thought that was an extraordinary moment um, for for the jurors. And in fact... The, the jurors deliberated for five hours before reaching their verdict, and they um, spoke to the media outside. And this is always very, very interesting to me. So CBS New York carried the verdict live, and we're going to play some clips here. This is, this is the verdict being read. I want you to really focus on the body language of the defense attorney, not just Angela Polina. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, listen to your verdict as the court records it. You say you find the defendant as to count one, murder in the second degree, guilty. As to count two, endangering the welfare of a child, guilty. As to count three, endangering the welfare of a child, guilty. As to count four, endangering the welfare of a child, guilty. As to count five, endangering the life of a child, guilty. So, say you all? Yes. 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 Do you want the jury pulled? I'm okay, thank you. So, Michael, what I found fascinating about that was he seemed almost more physically, emotionally upset than his client. Now, I don't know if it's because he's just emotionally exhausted or because everybody on Long Island, you know, hates him for defending this woman and being a part of this case. I I don't know what it was or if it was a little bit of everything. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. Obviously, I'm speculating and saying how he became that emotional. Um, But in speculating, I could say a few things about what it feels like Mm -hmm. as a defense attorney to be standing in that place where he was. Um, you still might have sympathy, sympathy for the client as horrendous as they may be, or their behavior may be, you might still have some place of, um, if not empathy, at least care for them. And uh, so that's one thing. Uh, you also really do, whether people believe it or not, defense attorneys have a lot of empathy for victims. In homicides, there really is a lot of emotion in that room that even the defense attorney has for victims of violent crime. Um, And then third, uh, and this really is a big thing, is it really is hard to be a defense attorney in a case where your client is absolutely guilty and you are fulfilling that constitutional role of providing them with counsel. And you know that the entire world hates your role and hates that you're doing that and finding a way to defend this person. And that makes you emotional too. But, you know, I feel very strongly about the work that I do, but it, uh, I feel strongly about the work that I do, but it, it takes an emotional toll when you're standing in a courtroom and especially in a case like this, where that courtroom has a lot of viewers, a lot of people in there and you feel the weight of that negative energy and it's pointed not just to your client but you are in the line of fire for sure as a defense attorney and that can make you emotional and then one last thing um trials are enormously stressful 
They take an incredible toll, whether you're representing an innocent, a guilty client, whatever, a prosecutor or a defense attorney, no matter what, a trial is overwhelming. And just the fact that it was over when a trial ends, it makes you emotional. You almost want to collapse. Yeah, I, I have not seen that in a long time in a defense attorney. And so I really, I did feel the magnitude of the pressure on yeah. him. We're speculating on what it was. It was probably a little bit of everything. Yeah, that's a little, right. A little bit of it. But without yeah. question, the man was under a great deal of stress. And then, you know, when the verdict was read, the, the judge turned to the jury and said, you made the right decision. You know, you did. Yeah. Y'all yeah. did the right thing. Um, the jurors were obviously very emotional. And then after the verdict, um, they talked to the cameras outside. And this interview was picked up by NBC New York. The fact that um, the evidence shown that it couldn't have been just the hosing down in the backyard alone that made her, the child hypothermia, that meant it was also the basement, the, the garage floor, which the defendant was involved with putting, making the child sleep there. I was very sad to, to be... To be sending someone to jail for for murdering a child, um, but I looked at her and uh, and I didn't look at her a whole lot, but I think she knew it was coming. You know, Mike, when the jurors are outside crying, you know, yeah. and they're emotional. Everyone in this case was emotional because it was a horrific murder. Horrific. Yeah, it is. It just the circumstances couldn't really be much worse than this. No. Angela Polina was convicted of second degree murder and four counts of endangering the welfare of a child on March 10th of 2023. Her sentencing hearing is scheduled for April 11th. Our next case is out of Los Angeles, where a well-known TV doctor and medical correspondent who worked at the NBC station in Los Angeles for more than 30 years is now a registered sex offender after pleading no contest to a felony charge of soliciting nude photos from a nine-year-old girl. According to the LA Times, he asked this child to send him, quote, sexy pictures, which of course she didn't understand what that meant. Dr. Bruce Hensel is 74 years old and full disclosure. I worked at NBCLA with Dr. Bruce Hensel for 13 years. 13 of those 30 years, I worked there. I was an investigative reporter and I anchored the news for seven years. And for seven years, I sat on the set with Dr. Bruce Hensel tossing to today's medical minute or whatever the hell that you know segment was called. Not friends with him. I never socialized with him. I never went out with him. I've never had a cup of coffee with him. Never been a favorite of mine. But that is neither here nor there, nor is that criminal. But you all need to understand that, that I feel a lot of news agencies have not covered this enough because of who he was and because he worked within the news. Uh, I am pleased that his own station, the one that we worked for, did cover this. It was the right thing to do. And so I want to talk about this case because I think it's important. When you have someone who has the public trust, this is the kind of guy who would give advice every day on the news about, take this drug, don't take this drug. This is the latest research, da 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 In fact, everyone calls, calls him and to this day refers to him as Dr. Bruce. The man didn't even need a last name. It's like Cher. You don't need a last name to know who he is. Well, in it's the not like Cher. No, it is not like Cher, but... <laughs> The, the fact that you could have someone in town who was so well known, literally everyone would be like Dr. Bruce, Dr. Bruce, everyone. And in addition to his TV job, you know, he worked full time at the TV station. He had been like co-director of two emergency rooms in Southern California. And he did spend a lot of time in the ER because I would see him come into work. And he'd have his scrubs on because he had to keep his hours up, you know, in order to be an ER doctor. So he is a real doctor, even though he is a TV doctor. But what this man stands accused of doing is just incredible. I mean, Mike, I mean, had you heard of Dr. Bruce before? I, I didn't know who Dr. Bruce was, but I've certainly um, represented defendants who were charged with similar conduct mm. as uh, Dr. Bruce. I've represented a number of them, uh, people in possession of child pornography, not this specific fact pattern of, of sort of 
um, enticing a young girl with the promise of some kind of stardom and then asking her for pictures. I haven't seen that fact pattern, but I've represented a number of people uh, for possession of child. And he was not charged with that. He was not charged with that. In fact, his defense attorney has been quite adamant that he claims that the photos were never sent by the little girl to Dr. Bruce. I don't know what the truth there is. You know, um, I'm going to ask you, what does it mean when you plead no contest to this felony? What does that mean? Does that mean he's guilty? Um, generally, it does mean he's guilty. In fact, the judge will say after taking a no contest plea that it means the same thing as guilty. Often, in fact, always a defense attorney wants their client to plead no contest rather than guilty, because when someone pleads guilty, they themselves are verbally accepting responsibility for the act. Uh, no contest plea, or sometimes referred to as a nolo contendere plea, basically means that you're not fighting the charges. So even though the judge will consider it a guilty plea, you yourself are not verbalizing it as a proclamation of guilt. It has one very specific effect, which is that it cannot be used in a civil case. A plea of guilty often can be used in a civil case against you. And I imagine there might be a civil case here. And I do understand that he was not charged with the possession of, of child pornography, but it becomes similar conduct in terms of wanting to somehow gain access or possession to these prurient images of children. And that's kind of how I meant it, that they I have represented people who were engaging in this desire to possess this kind of material. This makes no sense. The man was 72 at the time of this crime. The little girl was nine years old. There is no reason these two should have been communicating under any circumstances. And this level of communication, what, who could possibly yeah. be interested in looking at naked photos of a child that age? It's insane. In fact, when he, according to, uh, you know, the LA Times and their incredible reporting on this, when he first started asking her, according to the records that they found, that when he first started asking for photos, she would send him pictures of herself in like her little karate outfit or whatever, okay? The mind of a nine-year-old. And he then starts instructing her yeah. on what to send and what not to wear. It is astounding that he was even communicating with her in the first place. And it's also so shocking to me, you know, because he's never been in trouble before. He's never been accused of this specific behavior before. I don't know if there were other reputational issues with him, but certainly there was no concrete evidence that he has a history of any of this kind of conduct. And yet there he is in his 70s um, trying to solicit these photographs from a nine-year-old. It's just shocking. It's and disgusting. Again, yeah. It's disgusting. You know, this is a man, he's a doctor. He has a career, um, clearly a millionaire, lives in Pacific Palisades. Money is not an issue. Um, you know, a, a local celebrity with access to everything. It just is, it's astonishing. And so he ends up getting two years of probation after pleading no contest to contacting a minor with the intent to commit a crime. Uh, the doctor was arrested back in 2019. And as part of this plea deal, he is required to register as a sex offender. And the reason this case has been, they've been dealing with this case for two years. And the delay was that the defense did not want Dr. Bruce Hensel to be registered yeah. as a sex offender because they said that would impede his ability to be a doctor and would impede his ability to teach if he wanted to teach medicine. Really? This is what we're worried about? This well, is where the focus should be? If I'm the defense attorney, that's where your focus should be. I mean, it really is. I mean, yeah. you, you are, your, your role is to protect the client. It's the prosecutor's role to ensure the safety of the community, okay? Um, but the defense attorney's goal is to zealously represent the client. And I totally understand that this may be shocking and inexplicable and unfair to a lot of people, um, but it is actually quite common in these 
cases involving child pornography. And again, a different different fact patterns that I've had, but similar in terms of the, the psychopathy involved. Um, it is very common, actually, that these charges are reduced to misdemeanors. They don't carry a lot of probation. They rarely carry jail time. And one of the reasons why these deals are made and why even the defense attorneys probably felt like they had a credible argument for no registration is that there has not yet been a conclusive link between possession of child pornography or or even the conduct that the doctor is, is accused of and actual pedophilia, actually acting out on that. There is some link. There's There are definitely studies that have shown a link, but nothing conclusively that says if I possess child pornography or have a prurient interest in these types of images, it means that I'm gonna act out on it. Um, and this this is comes from the district attorney's office for years. Okay. It was it is not uncommon for them if they're if all they have is evidence of possession of the materials and nothing else, no evidence of acting out on that interest, they will commonly make deals that just sort of get somebody out of out of trouble. And and they, they obviously they want to observe the person and want to have some kind of ability to, to ensure that the person isn't acting out. But part of the reason why they do this is because they have not yet been able to really conclusively link the two. So a little background here on the case from the time he was arrested and what the LA Times was able to find out through of all things, the California Medical Board held a hearing after he was arrested to suspend his license. And in that hearing, documents were attached that included copies of the communications, allegedly between the doctor and the nine-year-old, and that became public record, which the LA Times was able to access. And so that is where all of the information came out because, you know, I went on the uh, DA's website last night because there was a reference in one of the news reports about um, uh, a news release about his arrest. And I'm like, wow, the whole website's been scrubbed. Dr. Bruce Hensel's not even mentioned here. Isn't that fascinating? Doesn't he get some special treatment here by the LA County District Attorney's Office? Access, privilege, you know, it gets, it buys you a lot buys you two years of negotiating. It buys you a lot. It buys you a lot here. So let's talk about what the LA Times uncovered from the medical board hearing documents, okay? So Hensel allegedly met the little girl through her mother. Bruce Hensel and the mother were discussing financing a movie, a possible vehicle for the nine-year-old to star in this. Hensel, who was 72 at the time, and she was nine, okay? He could be grandpa over here, started this direct communication that took place between March and August of 2019, according to the LA Times. Hensel was then arrested and charged in November of 2019, a few months later, after an investigation by the LAPD Internet Crimes Against Children Unit. And that is a unit that is very busy here at the LAPD. Bond was set unbelievably low. It was set at $5,000. Of course, he walked that afternoon, that evening. Is that typical also? I, I, I'm surprised that the bill was that low, but it also doesn't upset me that much because it wouldn't have made a difference if it were 50000 a 100000 It certainly shouldn't have been higher than that. I know that the behavior is disturbing. I get that it's upsetting, but um, on a, a spectrum of what the DA's office sees in terms of real harm to individuals, this falls way on the scale of not that serious in terms of the actual behavior of victimizing minors. It was communications that were absolutely inappropriate. It was soliciting materials that were absolutely pr prurient, but it, it still falls pretty low on the Richter scale of, of offenses that are gonna make the bail that high. It's violent crime. It's crime that places lives and safety at risk. That's where you see your high bails. So news cameras were waiting for Bruce Hensel when he got out of jail. And here's a clip from ABC7. Dr. Bruce, what do you have to say about the charge against you? Anything at all to say? Did you know the girl? What do you have to say to her family? 
So clearly he's asked a lot of questions. He continues walking and doesn't say a word. Um, as details of the crime were released, it really shocked this community. It certainly shocked all of my colleagues, especially because, you know, you it's like someone in the office who gets arrested on um, on such a heinous crime, you know, as such a charge. So thank goodness that the LA Times was able to obtain these records because here here is more information about what went on here. According to the LA Times, Bruce Hensel messaged the little girl, quote, I have always been good special friends and you feel safe with me, so I will protect you and get you something. They could maybe make you a star if you are willing to take some risks. She is nine years old. He asked her for sexy pictures. And then he asked her to keep this private, to not tell people. Why? Because the doctor knows it's wrong. So reportedly, the interactions became increasingly sexually explicit, with the victim initially sending Dr. Hensel fully clothed photos because... She probably thinks she looks adorable in her little outfits. Of course she does. She is nine years old. So in May of 2019, when he, she sends him pictures of herself clothed, according to the LA Times reporting, he responded, not enough. Not enough. Hensel continued to push the minor, insisting um, that the pictures she sent have to be, quote, has to be sexy, okay? And a nine-year-old, you know, they their comprehension of what sexy is is not even a word that should be used with a nine-year-old. This is not a conversation. I agree. This is not a descriptor that should be used with a child. According to the medical board records obtained by the Times, Hensel continued to instruct her to keep this private and secret. In one message, Hensel reportedly told the minor to take pictures, quote, in underwear or less. Now he is directing her on what it is that he wants. The nine-year-old reportedly then took nude photographs of herself in August of 2019. The nude photos and messages were later discovered by the victim's stepfather. He asked the girl to delete all the messages between herself and Hensel, and then he called the cops, and they began the investigation. Hensel was arrested on November 13th of 2019 and charged with one felony count of contact with a minor for sexual purposes. If convicted, he would have faced a maximum of 18 months in prison. Not a lot of time, I understand. So why did it take two years to get to this point of what we will call justice here? Okay, well, according to the LA Times, very good reporting. They cite several sources that say they were pushing really hard for a plea deal that did not include Bruce Hensel being registered as a sex offender. And then proof that money and access can pay off in the justice system to some degree here, Mike. <clears throat> Hensel's attorney hires a man named Steve Cooley. You and I know who he is. Other people may oh, not. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I covered Steve Cooley for years. Steve Cooley was a former L.A. County D.A. He's hired to consult on the case. Very specifically, according to Cooley, he was hired to consult on a policy that was written by him when he was the D.A. that would determine whether the doctor would have to be registered as a sex offender. So he's being called in as the expert who wrote the law. Should he, should he not be registered as a sex offender? Again, we're, we're buying, you know... Everything that they can on this case. So here's where the hypocrisy comes in in all of this, which I know oh, is a yeah. little in, inside baseball for everyone here in L.A., but I think, you know, we got to call out the crap when we see it. So Steve Cooley, at the time of this representation, was trying to get the current D.A., Gascon, to be recalled because many people, including myself, feel he is way too lenient with criminals. And it's basically, please, you commit a crime, here, out the door. Bail, don't worry about it. Go, go, go. It's fine. Go, offend. I know, Mike, I realize we- I completely we... disagree, but go ahead. Okay, <laughs> all right. So there was a recall, and Steve Cooley was behind the recall, and um, the recall failed. So the hypocrisy is, here's a man who is claiming that the current DA is too lenient against criminals and he is now working for a celebrity doctor trying to help him be, well, 
get some leniency and not be registered as a sex offender. The hypocrisy, the power, it's, it reeks, reeks. Disgusted by all of this, people. I'm disgusted by all of it, by all of it. Anyway, I don't, I, I, I think you just needed some context again about yeah. this man's position in the community to get this kind of access in Los Angeles. So really quickly, I do think yeah. that, that just to speak to the other side of this a little bit, I, I do think one of the calculations that the DA's office also engages in in determining what's an appropriate sentence in a case is the harm to the child. And the child's parents might not have wanted the child to be involved in this anymore. They might not have wanted the child to testify. And so that's a part of it. The other thing I'd really be interested in seeing, and I'm sure the defense did this, is a psychological evaluation of the doctor, because I'm sure that they presented some kind of comprehensive psych evaluation that said that he was had a low risk of criminal behavior. And perhaps, and I know that this might just sound like a defense attorney talking, but I do wonder given his age, if there isn't some kind of deterioration there, because it's just so shocking how even reckless this is, separate from how disgusting or inappropriate criminal, all of that, separate from that, it feels very reckless and a little nuts to me that he would even do this, like telling a nine-year-old to keep it a secret when it's not even like, to often to engage in a secret with a child, um, I I think the way that often a pedophile is is with a level of of, um, fear, yeah, which is usually done physically, like you're imposing and Mm -hmm. you're telling the child that they better not tell. But over text to tell a nine year old, don't tell anybody, how do you possibly trust that? So I'm wondering if there isn't something going on psychologically there as well. Oh, there's something going on. All right, Mike. <laughs> I, I got that one for sure. Um, so last week on March 6, Hensel went to court to enter his no contest plea and the victim's parents were in the courtroom. Man, what an interesting case. The girl's father told Hensel, quote, Dr. Bruce. You crossed the line and violated the vow of your profession, which is to cause no harm. Then Hensel apologized, claimed that this was an isolated incident. He said, quote, I am terribly sorry for what happened. I've done everything I can to understand this isolated thing. Hensel, then this is the interesting part. Then Hensel and the father hug in in court. Uh, It's like, don't touch me. Um... And the LA Times reports that the father forgave him. Yeah. Uh, It's unbelievable. So he pleads no contest to felony charge March 6th of 2023, sentenced two years probation required to register as a sex offender, which I believe was the right thing to do. You know, again, I don't know him, but I did work with him every frickin' day for 13 years, you know, and you know, not knowing, he was never really a pleasant person, which is why I was not friends with him. I did not like him. In fact, most of the staff did not like him. Not being liked is not criminal by any means. One more thought about the two years it took to resolve the case. That is a little bit on the long side for a case to resolve. But I think, you know, during most of 2021, so two years ago would have been maybe the end of 2020, the beginning of 2021, Mm -hmm. uh, COVID played a big part. It it really, for one year of that, uh, it was very easy to get continuances on cases because judges, people really didn't want uh, citizens in their courtroom. So, So that does explain a little bit of the delay. Oh, I'm sure Dr. Bruce managed to explain that to the judge. (laughs) Yes, Mm, right. Hi, yay, yay. Well, thank you for your insight on this one, Mike. <laughs> it is time for our comment section. These are the crime cases you all are talking about on social media, and our producer, Will Updike, is here now with what you all are talking about. Hey, Will. Hey, Anna. How's it going? Good. How are you? Doing well. Doing well, Mike. Good to see you. Nice to see you too, Well. All right. So this week, we have a very low stakes robbery uh, that does still end in an arrest. But this one comes out of Salt Lake City, where a 65-year-old man was arrested after he allegedly robbed $1 from a bank and then stayed inside until he was arrested. Um, So in a statement made by the Salt Lake City Police Department there, Donald Santa Croix walked into a Wells Fargo on Main Street and handed the bank teller a very polite note. Uh, It said, please pardon me for doing this. 
but this is a robbery. Please give me one dollar. Thank you. Which I, I don't know any more polite way to, to, to possibly do that. But uh, after Santa Croce got the money, uh, he a few, like he refused to leave. You know, normally in, in a bank robbery, you're, you're trying to get out of there as soon as you can, I think. Um, but the police officers finally arrived on the scene uh, and they arrested him for robbery. Uh, now, according to an affidavit that several media outlets have sourced, uh, he just waited in the bank la- lobby for the police to come. And I guess he got a little bit frustrated with how long the response was taking, uh, <laughs> because at one point he told some customers that everybody was lucky that he didn't have a gun and quote, because it was taking the police too long to get there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, they, they have protocols and everything, obviously, that a bank has to do, regardless of the, the size of the robbery. But the bank manager uh, brought the employees into a back room just for safety. Um, and, you know, Santa Cruz here, the, the suspect, said that he robbed the bank because he wanted to get arrested and go to a federal prison. Um, and I, which I, I can kind of get. Uh, he also said that if he gets out of jail, he plans to rob another bank and ask for more money mm-hmm. to try to get the desi- desired result of going to federal prison. Um, yeah, not sure exactly what his circumstances are here. I, I didn't see a whole lot of detail, but uh, the man seems very intent on going to prison, mm-hmm. um, which is it, which is a new one on me. It's a new one on me. Um, well, maybe he has a friend or a relative that he wants to visit, or maybe oh, he's heard that some of the low security federal so, prisons are very pleasant. They have tennis and other stuff. So that reminds me of a really funny case that I handled in which my client was extremely drunk and he went into a bank and he also very politely handed the teller a note. And the note said, I am the tickling bandit. Please give me all your money or I will tickle you to death. (laughs) And the teller started laughing and my client ended up leaving. And as his getaway car, he got into a Mack truck that did not belong to him. Oh my God. And sat in it and tried to get away until he was arrested. And believe it or not, that case went all the way to trial and a jury had to acquit him. The DA would not dismiss that case. Um, based on his intoxication. And the teller had to actually testify and say that she didn't take the note seriously. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Oh, Mike, your life is very fascinating. (laughs) Wow, Will. I I don't know what this guy is after. Safety in prison. It could be very tempting. If you're you're living a pretty hard scrabble life out there, prison maybe is not that bad an alternative. But yeah, he did well, pro- he did provide a community service like a fire drill. It's like, you know, the cops are taking too long to respond, people. And if I right. had a gun, this would be a bad situation for you. So, you know, give him what he wants yes, because he's doing exactly. a public service. That's right. <laughs> the bank manager also got some some practice to do these sort of these protocols to get all the tellers and everything in there. You know, they yeah, so they, there, they there know what a, they're doing. Yeah, there was a good result there. Everybody learned something. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, uh, so people, uh, people, like I said, were kind of up in the air on on why uh, the motivations behind this. But Sarah G said, I don't think a polite note to get one dollar from the bank is going to end up with him in federal prison. Yeah. So uh, one thing I was kind of reading that was interesting is the FBI agents posted there in Salt Lake did end up responding to this and, and getting involved with this. So I don't know about all that. And maybe that's just standard procedure. I, I wasn't really sure, but it seems like a, it seems like a lot for a dollar. Um, <laughs> uh, Anna V actually had some shade for Wells Fargo. They said, I'm only surprised that Wells Fargo didn't rob him, which you know, sometimes those, those bank fees are those bank, oh, those fees, bank are a fees. ridiculous. Over the there. poor guy. He should have at least asked for a bank fee back. 350, 750, whatever it's up to now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> Okay, and then a lot of people made references to uh, the old Fox show Prison Break. Um, where, oh, where, yeah, with Wentworth, yeah. what's oh, yeah. his name? Yeah, right. Wentworth yeah. Miller, he had all the tattoos. <laughs> yeah, so I, I said he obviously needs to go to prison to break his brother out, which is the entire premise of the show. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a wild case. And hopefully, yeah, hopefully like his circumstances aren't so dire that he, you know, he needs to to try go to, to prison. do this again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Poor guy. Wow. Poor guy. I know. Well, thanks, Will. Always Absolutely. good seeing you. <laughs> I know. I'll see you next week. <laughs> Bye, Bye, Will. Bye. Bye. Okay, Mike. Now we have to talk Oscars. 
Okay. Oh, so the this, is this like your fourth one? Yeah. Well, you know, the thing to know about me is that I am a huge film buff. I mean, I have loved movies since I was a little kid and I have especially loved the Oscars, which I used to watch with my mom every Monday, because if you're my yes. age, you remember that the Oscars used to be on Mondays. And then I've had Oscar parties. I've always mm -hmm. loved them. So luckily I have some friends in the movie industry and some of those friends are actually members of the Academy. And so they always know that if they have an extra ticket, I'm the guy you call. So that's why every once in a while I get the call and I put on my tux and I go to the Oscars and I see all the stars. And it's the, just the most wonderful experience in the world when you were the kind of kid I was that loved the Oscars growing up. Oh my God, that's so huge. So do yeah. you get like really good seats or do you sit in the balcony? <laughs> no. I'm just curious. <laughs> uh, we sit in the balcony, um, but, uh, but it doesn't matter. Just being in that room, the excitement of being in the room. You know, one of the big, one of the great things about being inside the auditorium when the Oscars are being announced is the excitement when the winner's name is announced. You could really feel it in the room. You know, everybody is really super happy no matter what the category. It could be short subject, um, it could be sound, it could be best actor, best actress, best picture. Uh, people are just so thrilled whenever someone's name is announced as the winner because we understand that that's a big deal to them. Wow. So it, it was really exciting to be there. And so I who did, been in a while. So who did you see? Did you see anybody like really famous? I uh, saw a lot of people, saw Nicole Kidman, Saw Did Lady she look Gaga perform, which was amazing. Lady Gaga. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yes. Um, saw Jesse Buckley from the movie Women Talking. Oh, was, I love that, that movie. Was fun. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Steven Spielberg was one of the best ones. Really up close. I got to see Steven Spielberg because he was right on the red carpet as I was walking by. So that was really cool because he's a big one. Oh, he is. He's a legend. He's an icon. Yeah, yeah. How exciting. You know, there was a weird point in my career at that same TV station, the NBC <laughs> station, that for a few years there, they assigned me to cover entertainment. Can you picture this? <laughs> knowing knowing my specialty in life and and what I do it's I was like such a fish out of water and I remember covering the Oscars and all these events for like it was like for two years they assigned me to this and I could not understand why <laughs> why would you put Anna Garcia on this and I was <laughs> and I was always so puzzled as to as I'm doing the red carpet thing and yeah. you're trying to get people to stop and talk it was always so hard on that day to like ask intelligent questions, you know, um, beside who are you wearing? Yeah, yeah. Who are you reading? Who yeah, are you? It's lighthearted. It's very lighthearted, which, you know, is kind of fun. Nobody's yeah. dead. That's the nice thing. And except for last <laughs> year when Will Smith slapped Chris Rock, yeah, there's usually no was... violence or a crime. Um, wow. And I did find that the Oscars this year were much more entertaining. Jimmy Kimmel was very funny, and there were I some great them. moments, some really yeah, great moments. It was a lot of fun. Did you go to a fancy party afterwards? Oh, I, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say. Okay, don't say. It's I, all right. I don't know if people were supposed to be invited to that. No, people like me, anyway. But oh my I did God. go to a great party. Oh That's my all God. I'll say. You're such a fancy pants. <laughs> Mike Cavaluzzi, the secret life of Mike Cavaluzzi. So let me tell you, everyone, you should follow this man because otherwise you'd be like, you know, your life is very interesting, but you are a kind hearted man. Oh, and... thank you, Anna. So are you. Or a kind hearted oh, woman. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mike, where can people find you if they need an attorney, if they hold up a bank with you tickles? Can, you can go to my website, CavaluzziLaw.com, but you can also just call my office number 323-467-2300. I am a normal, regular, everyday lawyer in court every day. Happy to help. You can find me at Anna G News on all social. Uh, you can get this podcast, all of our podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is more than 5 million rich. And of course, our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. So until next time, I'm your host, Anna Garcia. This is True Crime Daily, the podcast. And as we always say, don't do crime. Don't do crime.